Sure, Jen, you'll leave a message and I'll get back to you. Right. Hey, Jen, it's Josh. Let's scrap the idea for you scoring my movie. I, I don't want you to score the movie anymore, not at the moment. We'll do it in time, but I have another idea. Let's create something together. Let's co-create it. Let's build it from the ground on up. Let's make it a musical. But let's never call it that. Let's call it a popsicle. That's what it is. This is a popsicle. I'll write the story. You write the music. We'll write it together. All right, call me back. Cheers, bye. Hey, it's called Josh. Where's the message? Hey, Josh. Um, it's a great idea, man. I'm right up for it. I think it's it's the future. Whatever this is, let's make it ambitious and surreal. And uh, if possible, we'll break hearts where we can break hearts and create possibilities for everyone, man. I'm totally in. Hey, uh, Dennis, Josh. So here's the story, roughly. So it's Jack Winton. He's a steel worker. He lives a grey, unremarkable life. He's in his 30s. He sits in a bleached out world. There's no colour in his world. He's paralysed by his apathy. He's just imprisoned. He lives in a world stripped of colour. It's a sort of place where uh, smokestacks and sadness rule. In this place, imagination has been banned and hope has been barred. And the only way out of his world is to listen to a few minutes of pop music every day before he goes to work in a rusted out factory. Hey, Josh. I'm just sitting at home working on this score. I'm really seeing this. I think I've got an idea for a theme. I think I know how to express this grayness you speak of. Let me know what you're seeing, man. But that's it, that's it, that's totally it's awesome. All right. So one day he falls into a coma, his head is clipped by a steel beam and he's played a brain dead. And he's left alone and abandoned in, in a hospital room on a life support machine that feels like it's going to give away at any second. But then he wakes up and he looks around, but he's not in the hospital anymore. He's in a lush forest and he has no idea how he got there. He looks around, but he realises very quickly this is not the world he came from. He's in a world filled with colour. It's, it's vibrant, really intense colour. The streets are teeming with people and they sing. They've got their own particular melody. And someone tells him that we sing to each other to connect and communicate and make sense of all that can't be made sense of in this or any other life. What do you think? Josh, I've got a full moon beaming through my brain. I think I've got a theme for Melodia. Uh, this is a love story, right? Um, when they're in love, they see colours more intensely with greater clarity. Tell me what you think, and let's not do this over the sun anymore. Roll up to my house and we'll make this happen, all right? several years to his former life, his former reality. Jack has to find a way to communicate with no musical ability in the real world, in a place that doesn't believe in him, what's in his heart, his personal sympathy. Let's call it, uh, my mind's a melody. Completely ripped apart
So I'm Josh Wakeley, I'm the writer and director of a cinematic musical. And Daniel is not creating the score, but creating the film with me. So that was a little insight into how the movie began, but I don't want to talk about the movie so much, not today. Hopefully you'll be able to watch it one day. I would like to talk to you about the discoveries we've made while undergoing this unusual collaboration, and I would hope that in some way, some small way, they apply and resonate with what you do. Now, one would suggest we have no business making a cinematic musical, but that's exactly what we're doing. We begin shooting the first part of this experience in about five weeks. So I'm not a musician, not at all. But I've never written a creative word without listening to music, never ever. Music has to be soaring through my ears before I can put pen to paper. It is, I guess, what motivates my particular art form. And Daniel is not a film director. But most of Daniel's music, and I hope I'm not sort of letting out a trade secret this, here, but I've observed this, is, uh, is written as he watches movies with the sound turned down or as he pours over a Salvador Dali or a Brett Whiteley painting. Daniel's motivated by visuals rather than volume. Truthfully, I'm in a way partly tone deaf, and Daniel doesn't write down shopping lists, let alone screenplays, and yet that's exactly what we're doing. I'm in a way a creator of the music by infusing it with my story, and Daniel is a creator of the screenplay, helping to create the story through the emotional momentum and narrative thrust of his music. And through this unusual collaboration, we've learned a few things. We've stumbled across a few ideas, just a few. So we'll try and share with you what we've learned. One was the discovery that both me and Daniel are storytellers. I write and direct films. Daniel writes and directs music. But the reason this collaboration works is based on the first lesson we've learned. And here it is. Narrative is melody, and melody is storytelling. The melodic substance of our great writers is, is in fact what they're striving for. When they hear it properly, the, the melody of it, they know their story is working. There's a music to a Dylan Thomas. The screenwriter Aaron Sorkin, who wrote The Social Network, spoke of the inherent melody that his screenplays have to have when they are to use uh, another musical phrase, singing. It needs to be entwined through the story so that it only sounds right when sung in a particular way or delivered in a particular manner. Verses and choruses, these terminologies we're familiar with through our songwriters, but all good writers, screenwriters in particular, use them and call them different things. I, when I write, use a system of verses and choruses. Admittedly, there just aren't people calling out in a crowd to hear them. Play the first act, Josh. Does, doesn't happen. <laughs> John Lennon, David Bowie, Lou Reed, and Daniel Johns are all seeking to tell stories through melody. All great writers are seeking to find melodic expression to their stories. It's a way, I guess, of explaining the most complicated fragments of life in a way that sounds tuneful to our souls. So here's the second idea we came across. The closest collaborations often occur when the collaborators have skills that are diametrically opposed. The closest collaborations emerge when people come from furthest away. I think too often, I've been guilty of it, we collaborate with people who share our skill set rather than coming from, a, coming from a completely opposite viewpoint, be it socially, actually, creatively or emotionally. My intuition, and it's just my intuition, is that this can apply further afield than just creative mediums and it can, it can apply across all fields and disciplines. I guess what I'm saying is, in short is, if you want to find a way to solve a problem, seek out someone from a totally different field who has a totally different way of working. It can quite possibly reawaken your perspective. This whole experience has renewed us with such incredible creative energy that I can't recommend doing it enough. Engage with someone from a different field to find out what it is that you truly want to do in your field, is what I'm saying. And I think, in short, you should not limit yourself by what you can do, but you should limit yourself by what you can imagine. If you're limited by your own personal skill set, then seek out the right people to achieve your ideas. So me and Daniel are only relatively young, so I won't pretend to know anything. There's been a lot of experts today. That guy that made the bird go around the room, that's, that's expert. an expert. <laughs> 
But here's the, the third thing we've learned. The storyteller's job is to question. Christopher Volga, who's like a story expert, if there can be such a thing, and has worked on a bunch of contemporary classic films, studied story all around the world, and he found that Australian storytellers in particular were completely different from the rest of the world. They have a unique way of telling stories, and that's that we nearly always, nearly always leave a question mark at the end of our stories rather than a definitive answer. Think Pitnick and Hanging Rock, the work of Peter Weir, indeed all the work of Tim Winton. Indeed the music of my collaborator Daniel Johns. And that's cool. That's great in fact. I think that's the storyteller's job, to question, not to define. And it's what we've discovered as we've created this film and it's what we've attempted to infuse our story with. And I think, and it's just a feeling, that the world at the moment needs more pertinent and complex questions to be asked and less simple answers. So we only learnt one more lesson. Here's the fourth one that we learnt. Whatever works, works. <laughs> the most unusual ways of working, the most unique, the most unusual sources of inspiration, if they work, they work. The imagination often wants to evolve very quickly beyond traditional modes of working. So I guess don't settle for the old parameters that have been set in all your new industries. For us, the idea of bringing music to visuals and visuals to music is a more powerful and ambitious way of articulating our collective visions. And I would hope for all of you in this room, there's a new collaboration on the horizon that allows you that to, uh, to articulate a vision or idea you have. In short, we reckon there's a quiet wisdom in embracing new ways of working. Because like I said, Whatever works, works. Now, we're just going to quickly show you a short video here, and it shows the unusual way that me and Daniel began to make our screenplay and our hour and a half of score. Um, it's a little snippet of work that shows the unusual method that we came across to work out how to personally articulate our vision. <laughs> Song growing in volume, moving to his eyes, traversing a map of his iris, a vibrant colour, shapes and lines, feel. That little tiny snippet of work was me reading out the script and describing the story, how I saw it visually, images that I saw, as Daniel composed music live. Now we're going to try it out for you here, we'll see how it goes. We're sort of going to riff off the parts of the script and uh, Daniel will play live as we do that. And you'll see how we created this screenplay and score. So uh, here's the script, let's see how this you goes. You tell me about this bit. <laughs> well, got to keep some things quiet between your collaborators. That's the fifth one we didn't put up there. <laughs> yeah, we learned the fifth one. <laughs> All right, ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Jack begins to look around the world. It's a world filled with vibrant colour. The sky is a deep purple. He's at the edge of a forest leading to a village. Jack walks through a village where everyone is singing to each other. The streets are teeming with people and they sing with their own particular melody. A melody that's unique to them, their own special voice. And Jack wonders why everyone in this world is singing. And someone says to him, well, they, they, they sing to each other to connect and communicate and make sense of all that can't be made sense of in this or any other life. You've come to a place so broken and clear. So lost for so long and so full of fear Let's tell me low, my dear, my dear We are young, we're full of love and we are here, we are here This is not a coincidence, we came to bury our fears Alive and celestial, wipe away painful tears. Alleviate your hurt and bandage your scars. We are matrons of spirit. We're giving life to your
Jack looks up and sees a beautiful woman walking towards him. She has a special beauty. She's ethereal and yet naive. She has blue eyes, They're the kindest eyes he's ever seen and the most striking voice he's ever heard. She wonders if he's okay. She gets closer and she begins to sing to him, to calm him, to soothe him, to welcome him into this new world. And Melody brings her hand gently to his face and her voice gently to his ears. And Jack moves into a touch, a kindness in it he cannot recall ever experiencing. And Jack knows that this place is like no other place on earth. But then Jack is not on earth anymore. He's in Melodia. Why can't I sing These melodies in my heart Jack's not sure how he arrived in this world, only that it's a place full of vibrant colour and, and wild possibility. Whereas before he lived in a universe full of factories, a place where his wife ignored him and the world insulted him. He is now suddenly in a place painted with sandstone and celestial colours. And he knows he's finally found, after all those aching, lonely years, a place where he belongs. And it's in this place that he'll fall in love deeply. And for the very first time, he'll be married. Oh. <laughs> Please ripped apart and
So we're going to jump ahead now, and uh, we'll finish by saying this is a small slice of what we're creating and creating, and we're going to leave you with one, one of the final songs in the film. And uh, I hope you get to watch the film at some point, but I also hope, perhaps more, that this helps you with all the beautiful collaborations you'll go ahead and make. But this is a song that comes just before the big twist that's in this tale, so um, let's get all jazz. All right. <laughs> Thanks for listening to what we've created. We see an old man. His face is ravaged with age. He's got lines upon lines. His years of living buried in his skin. He's in an old run-down asylum. This man has been forgotten. And we move closer to this forgotten man. This ancient man. And as we do, we hear the sounds of a pop song growing in volume. We get closer and closer to the man. And we move into his eyes, which are an electric blue, still young somehow in this ancient body. We move closer and closer into his iris, as if we're traversing a map. His iris moves the rare electricity. We move through it, across it. We see vibrant color, shapes and lines. And we begin to move in, into another world. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, guys. Oh, no.